Maldives is a magical place, full of majesty and mystery. Its chain of 26 atolls are situated atop the Chagos Lakadiv Ridge, a vast submarine mountain range in the Indian Ocean. With an average ground level elevation of 1.5 meters, 4 feet 11 inches above sea level, it is the world's lowest country, with even its highest natural point being the lowest in the world at 2.4 meters or 7 feet 10 inches. The earliest settlers to the Maldives were most likely wayward Austronesian thatched reed boat sailing migrants, traveling from the South Pacific Islands to settle in Madagascar on the east coast of Africa. Seafaring from Dibal, modern Pakistan, began during the Indus Valley Civilization, 4600 to 3,900 years ago. The earliest historical record of the Maldives describes the arrival there of Sinhalese people, descended from the Magadha prince Viahaya, 2,543 until 2,505 years ago, exiled from the ancient city known as Sinhumpura in northeast India. He and his party of several hundred landed in Sri Lanka and some in the Maldives circa 543 to 483 BC. According to the Mahavansa, one of the ships that sailed with Prince Vyahaya who went to Sri Lanka around 500 BC, went adrift and arrived at an island called Mahila Dvipika, which may be identified with the Maldives. It is also said that, at that time, the people from Mahila Dvipika used to travel to Sri Lanka. Dravidian Tamils from Tamilakam, southernmost tip of India, in the Sangam period, 300 BC until 300 AD, settled on Giravaru Island and established a capital and kingly rule in Malay, where the people granted permission to a visiting king, Koimala. Kalo, prior to the foundation of his kingdom there. Malabri, seafaring culture, led to Malayalai, Keralites, settling the Lakadivis, and the Maldives were evidently viewed as an extension of that archipelago. Sindhis, in modern Pakistan, may have also migrated to the Maldives early on based on later Jat, Gujar titles, and Gotra names. So the Maldives was a cultural melting pot from very early on in the now known history of early civilizations and it may have likely been a port of call in trans-Indian Ocean reed boat seafaring as well. There is a global vestigial memory of our species pre-Ice Age conditions, and that is that, to this day, a simple game may be played just by interlacing one's fingers through a loop of string. European versions of this are called Cat's Cradle, but the game seems to have originated very long ago and near Polynesia in the South Pacific. The geographic midpoint between the earlier oceanic origins of this game and the later Asiatic versions 
so important to formulating very early Occidental concepts of metaphysics, such as Semitic Kabbalah, is between Sorobaya and Java and the Makaresi and Bugis of South Celebes, in short, throughout the East Indian archipelago, where the game is played as well and called Toike Toike, the latter game, derived from Toike, meaning steps. Modern conventional wisdom dictates that the first Maldivians did not leave any archaeological remains and that their buildings were probably built of wood, palm fronds, and other perishable materials which would have quickly decayed in the salt and wind of the tropical climate. Moreover, chiefs or headmen did not reside in elaborate stone palaces, nor did their region require the construction of large temples or compounds. Nevertheless, we may also learn Norwegian adventurer and ethnographer Thor Heyerdahl, October 6, 1914, until April 18, 2002, investigated the mounds found on the Maldive Islands in the Indian Ocean and found solar cycle-oriented foundations and courtyards, as well as statues with elongated earlobes. Heyerdahl believed that these finds fit with his theory of a seafaring civilization that originated in what is now Sri Lanka, that colonized the Maldives, and that influenced or founded the cultures of ancient South America and Easter Island. Heyerdahl discovered not only evidence of megalithic and brick architecture, arranged in circular arenas, and square temples, alike the Norte Chico structures in Peru, but an array of carved stone bust artifacts that appear to span many different eras and cultures. Thus, the Maldives could have been such a multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multicultural hub in prehistoric times that a speculation may be posed as to if it continued to be used as a form of museum, housing these artifacts from dispersed, distant cultures at a location geographically centered between them all. However romantically charming such a theory as a megalithic Maldives museum may seem, the reality behind Maldives' true importance is far more mundane and yet also more shocking than even that. Should it ever prove true, the real reason for all this building up of prehistoric Maldives is far simpler. Cowrie shells. The Maldives and Lakative Islands supplied Cypria Monita, so-called money cowrie for trade for most of the world up until the 18th century. Cowries are highly prized as a low denomination means of exchange for several of the same reasons that modern metal coins are valued. They are durable, difficult to forge, and have a limited source of supply. During the 19th century, the increasing use of metal coins led to a relatively rapid decline in the cowrie trade. Today, the once great Maldivian money cowrie trade is all but dead, with only a few handfuls of cowries exported annually. Use of shell money occurred on every populated continent. America, Asia, Africa, and Australia. The shell most widely used worldwide as currency was the shell of Cypriam Monita, the money cowrie. 
This species is most abundant in the Indian Ocean and was collected in the Maldive Islands, in Sri Lanka, along the Malabar coast, in Borneo, and on other East Indian islands, and in various parts of the African coast, from Ras Hufan to Mozambique. Cowrie shell money was important at one time or another in the trade networks of Africa, South Asia, and East Asia. Monetaria monita, a species of small sea snail, a marine gastropod mollusk in the family Cypridea, the cowries, can be found widely in Indo-Pacific tropical waters. It is present in numerous regions, including East and South Africa, Madagascar, the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, Maldives, Eastern Polynesia, Galapagos, Clipperton, and Cocos Islands off Central America, southern Japan, Midway, and Hawaii, and northern New South Wales and Lord Howe Island. It lives in intertidal rocky areas and shallow tide pools among seaweed, coral remains, and empty bivalve shells. It can be found on and under rocks in shallow water and on exposed reefs at low tide. It feeds on algae and marine vegetation, growing on loose rocks and pieces of dead coral. The Maldavians developed a simple, highly efficient means of collecting the cowrie. Bundles of coconut palm fronds would be laid out in shallow lagoons and the cowries would then aggregate on them to feed on the layers of detritus that accumulate on the leaves. After some time, the bundles are pulled out onto the beach where the cowries die in the hot sun and can be shaken off onto the sand. Dead animals are then buried in a pit so that the flesh rots away with the assistance of invertebrate detritivores, leaving clean, empty shells. Cowrie shells may be rolled, like dice that have only two sides, a head's side that is the back of the shell, and a tail's side that is the shell's mouth. Thus, they have some oblique form of use in very ancient and obscure divination rituals, supposedly included in modern African animism and in Joyatisha, or Vedic Hindu astrology, where 108 shells are used in a complex process for horary astrology, an ancient branch of horoscopic astrology in which an astrologer attempts to answer a question by constructing a horoscope for the exact time at which the question was received and understood by the astrologer. This practice continued today in Kerala, India, calls the cowrie shells cavadis, and proposes a pair of counting experiments be performed using them. The first, the Prashnam horoscope, rolls the 108 shells initially. The second, the Prasna horoscope, then deducts the amount that turned heads up as belonging to the ruling planet at that time. The two results are then compared and a prediction made. At some point, cowrie shells went from being used as beads and jewelry as a show of status to being used as an economic means of counting out assigned values. Because it remains unclear during which stage in our own evolution this transition occurred, it cannot necessarily be ruled out that use of cowrie shells as money of exchange may date back as long ago as the first now known use of tally sticks, such as the Ordination Labombo bones from around 30,000 years ago, as a form of money of account. At this same period of time, we would have been sharing caves with Neanderthals first combining animal hides with textile clothing 
and first developing the ability to form more complex verbal sounds, the prototypes of modern words. In China, from some 3,000 years ago, the pictogram for cowrie shell became the term used to symbolize money as a concept in itself. Starting in about 1500 AD and continuing into the late 1800s, the Coast Miwok, Olon, Patwin, Pomo, and Wapo peoples of Central California used the marine bivalve Saxidomus to make shell money. On the east coast of North America, the members of the Iroquois Confederacy and Algonquin tribes, such as the Shinnecock tribe, ground beads called wampum, which were cut from the purple part of the shell of the marine bivalve Mercenaria mercenaria, more commonly known as the hard clam or cahog. In Orissa, India, cowrie shells, locally called kaudi, were accepted as currency until 1805 when they were outlawed by the British East India Company, an event which contributed to the 1817 Paik Rebellion there. Trade in cowrie shell money was still prevalent throughout Africa by 1850 AD when German explorer Heinrich Barth observed it in Kano, Kuka, Gando, Muniyama of Bornu, Timbuktu, and the Kingdom of Congo, where the cowrie currency was called Nzimbu. In 1882, local trade in the Solomon Islands was carried on by means of a coinage of shell beads, small shells laboriously ground down to the required size by the local women. No more than were actually needed were made, and, as the process was difficult, the value of the coinage was stably maintained. In the Papua New Guinea island of East New Britain, shell currency is still legal, and a fixed exchange rate to the Kina national currency is maintained. Coins are believed to have been invented in Lydia around the 600s BC. Lydia was an Iron Age kingdom of Western Asia Minor, located generally east of ancient Ionia in the modern Western Turkish provinces of Ushak, Manisa, and inland Izmir. Its population spoke an Anatolian language known as Lydian. Its capital was Sardis. The kingdom of Lydia existed from about 1200 BC until 546 BC. At its greatest extent during the 600s BC, it covered all of western Anatolia. In 546 BC, it became a province of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, known as the Satrapy of Lydia, or Sparta, in Old Persian. In 133 BC, it became part of the Roman province of Asia. The first metal coins ever made were electrum, and date back to the end of the 600s or the beginning of the 500s BC. Electrum is a naturally occurring alloy of gold and silver with trace amounts of copper and other metals. It has also been produced artificially and is often known as green gold. The ancient Greeks called it raw or white gold as opposed to refined gold. Its color ranges from pale to bright yellow depending on the proportions of gold and silver. Electrum was used as early as 2000 BC in the Old Kingdom of Egypt, 
sometimes as an exterior coating to the pyramidians atop ancient Egyptian pyramids and obelisks. It was also used in the making of ancient drinking vessels. The gold content of naturally occurring electrum in modern western Anatolia ranges from 70 to 90 percent. In contrast to the 45 to 55 percent gold in electrum used in ancient Lydian coinage of the same geographical area. This may imply that one reason for the invention of coinage in that area was to increase the profits from seniorage by issuing currency with a lower gold content than the commonly circulating metal. The daughter of Agamemnon of Siamese, Damodice, is credited by Julius Pollux with inventing coined money after she married King Midas, King Mita of Phrygia, who lived in the 700s BC. The oldest now known Lydian lion coin was minted by Aliates of Lydia, 610 until 560 BC. Coins from Siamese, when first circulated around 600 to 550 BC, utilized the symbol of the horse, tying them to the house of Agamemnon and the glory of the Greek victory over Troy. Syme, being geographically and politically close to Lydia, took their invention of noblemen's tax tokens to the citizens, thus making Syme's rough incuse horse head silver fractions, hemiobols, the second oldest coins and the first used for retailing on a large scale basis by the Ionian Greeks. Coins were first made of scraps of metal. Ancient coins were produced through a process of hitting a hammer positioned over an anvil. The type was engraved on a die upon which was placed a pre-weighed piece of electrum that was then struck with a punch, a simple rod, and a hammer. As a result, the main side received the type in positive. The other side was left with one or several punch marks, called an incuse, which exposed the interior of the coin. Each issuing authority used a principal identifying type on its coinage. The shape and number of punches varied according to their denomination and weight standard. The earliest coins have a rough incuse, where the hammer was beaten directly onto the reverse. Later technology used a punch, often a square incuse, to improve the aim of the hammer, sometimes resulting in a swastika pattern. Punches developed to bear the mark of the minter, and finally to have their own design, leading to double-sided coins. The first coins in India were minted around the 500s BC by the Mahayana Padas of the Indo-Gangetic Plain. These were punch-marked coins called Puranas, Karshapanas, or Pana. Some of them were struck by a single punch, thus carrying only one symbol. For example, Sarashtra had a humped bull and Dakshin Panchala had a swastika. Others, like the coins of Magadha, were struck by several punches, often five, and thus carried several symbols. These coins were made of silver of a standard weight but with an irregular shape. The blanks, unstruck coins, 
were made by cutting up silver plates into pieces of appropriate size and then cutting each piece down to a desired precise weight, typically by cutting the corners. The Maurya Empire was a geographically extensive Iron Age historical power which dominated ancient India between 322 and 187 BC. During the Mauryan Empire, coins were punch-marked with the royal standard to ascertain their authenticity. The Arthashastra, written by Kautilaya, mentions the minting of coins and indicates that a violation of the imperial Maurya standards by private enterprises may have been a criminal offense. Cotilia also references a theory of bimetallism for coinage, involving the use of two metals, copper and silver, under one government. The Sumerian word shekel derives from she, which meant wheat, and kel, which was a measurement similar to a bushel. Hence, this coin was a symbol for the value of one bushel of wheat. The weight, one shekel, was equal to 180 grains of barley, or around 11 modern grams. Thus, the Hebrew word shekel was based on a Sumerian root term related to weight and measure. Use of the word was first attested in around 2150 BC during the Akkadian Empire under the reign of Namar Sin and later in around 1700 BC in the Code of Hammurabi. Moabites, Edomites, and Phoenicians used the shekel as well. The Carthaginian, or Punic shekel, was typically around 7.2 grams in silver and 7.5 grams in gold, suggesting an exchange rate of 12 to 1, but only worth around half a Tyrian shekel. The Tyrian shekel, called tetradrachmas by the Greeks, began to be issued around 300 BC. They weighed four Athenian drachmas, about 14 grams, more than the earlier 11 gram shekels. Herodotus states that the first coinage was issued by Croesus, king of Lydia, leading to the golden derrick worth 20 sigloi, or shekels, issued by the Persian Empire, and to the silver Athenian obol and drachma. What is about to follow for the remainder of this section is a reading from Malcolm C. Duncan's 1866 Masonic Ritual and Monitor. This work purports to reveal the secrets of contemporary Freemasonry. However, it has been in the public domain since passing a century following its publication, and I repeat from it here intending to reveal no hidden secrets or mysteries of Freemasonry that are not already freely knowable by all. In this segment, the means of payment for the workers building Solomon's Temple is discussed. Quote, On the sixth hour of the sixth day of every week, the craft, being eighty thousand in number, formed in procession and repaired to the office of the senior grand wardens to receive their wages and in order to prevent the craft being imposed upon by unskillful workmen, each craftsman claiming wages was made to thrust his hand through a lattice window and at the same time give his token, 
holding under the two last fingers of his hand a copy of his mark. The senior grand warden casts his eye upon the corresponding mark in the book where all the marks of the craft, 80,000 in number, were recorded, and, seeing how much money was due to that particular mark, placed it between the thumb and two forefingers of the craftsman, who withdrew his hand and passed on, and so on, each in his turn, until all were paid off. If any person attempted to receive wages without being able to give the token, the senior grand warden seized him by the hand, drew his arm through the window, held him fast, and exclaimed immediately, An impostor! Upon this signal, an officer, who was stationed there for that purpose, would immediately strike his arm off, close quote. As of early 2017 A.D., if all the gold in the world were evenly distributed to everyone alive, every person on planet Earth could own five gold rings. This is based on looking first at the amount of gold there is above ground, whether in bank vaults, museums, or in circulation as jewelry or bullion and looking second at the amount of human population at the moment. How much above ground gold, gold that has been mined, is there in the world? The best estimate at the end of 2011 is that around 165,000 metric tons have been mined in all of human history. That's about 181,000 881 ordinary tons, or 363,762,732 pounds, or 5,820,203,717 ordinary ounces. As of January 2017, the world population was passing 7,363,335,900 people. That leaves just below 24 grams of gold to each person on planet Earth, or around 0.79 troy ounces around 8.3 regular ounces per person. In an ordinary male gold wedding band at 18 karat purity, there are about 5 grams of pure gold. That means that every person on planet Earth could own about 5 gold rings. The Mesopotamian civilization developed a large-scale economy based on commodity money. The shekel was the unit of weight and currency referring to a specific weight of barley or equivalent amounts of silver, bronze, copper, etc. The Babylonians and their neighboring city-states later developed the earliest system of fiscal economics in terms of rules on debt legal contracts, and law codes relating to business practices and private property. The Code of Hammurabi, the best preserved ancient law code, was created around 3,760 years ago. It was enacted by the sixth Babylonian king, Hammurabi. Earlier collections of laws include the Code of ur Nammu, King of Ur, around 2050 BC, the Code of Ishinuna, around 1930 BC, and the Code of Lipit Ishtar of Isin, around 1870 
BC. These first laws set amounts of interest on debt, fines for wrongdoing, and sums of compensatory dues for various infractions of formalized law. However, in the ancient empires of Egypt, Babylon, India, and China, the temples and palaces often had commodity warehouses which issued certificates of deposit, a mark. As evidence of a claim upon a portion of the goods stored in the warehouses. Because these IOU receipts, or claim tickets, could be redeemed at the warehouse for the commodity they represented, they were able to be bartered in the markets as if they virtually were the commodity itself. An IOU, abbreviated from the phrase IOU, is usually an informal document acknowledging debt. Promissory notes differ from IOUs in that they contain a specific promise to pay along with the steps and timeline for repayment as well as consequences if repayment fails. IOUs only acknowledge that a debt exists. A promissory note sometimes referred to as a note payable, is a legal instrument, more particularly a financial debt instrument, in which one party, the maker or issuer, promises in writing to pay a determined sum of money to the other, the payee, either at a fixed future time or else on demand by the payee under specific terms. Historically, promissory notes have acted as a form of privately issued currency.